Hello. So our speaker today is Dr. Rick Ol Olchesi, and he's a licensed clinical neurologist in California. He's developed treatment programs for individuals with neuropsychological difficulties, including stroke, minor brain injury, attention deficit disorder, and learning disorders. And he also currently consults with the Santa Rosa Junior College and Sonoma State Universities with their athletic departments. Thank Thanks. Still morning. Good morning. It was nice to be introduced to all of you. It was nice to have you introduced to me. That's kind of neat. I like that. Um, so we're going to spend some time together today talking about neuropsychology tra of trauma. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about minor brain injury, but we're going to talk about PTSD and other things too, and I think you'll capture that as we go through the slides. I am a visual person, so I look at the slides, so I don't mean to turn my back to you guys over there. Can you hear it? How's that? Okay. I don't mean to turn my back, but I'll try to look at you guys every once in a while. Um, ah, thanks. <laughs> I can see my slides there, too. Um, you know, to get started, I just got a haircut lately. So if the, if the hair, if, if, if you get a glare, just kind of close your eyes and listen. Um, and, and, this, and I would like to say that I did not get a chance uh, in my haste to make uh, copies of my slides on paper. Um, but if you would like that, uh, you could email me and I'll send them to you. And uh, actually, it, it, it it's on there? It, it'll get put up on the website. Beautiful. You can see it on the website. Uh, so if the glare is already, yes? Um, D is in David, R R I C K O at yahoo.com. It's also in the newsletter. Also in the newsletter. So if the glare is already bothering you, I'd like you to just close your eyes right now. I'm going to read something to you that's going to take a couple of minutes. And I use this as a meditation sometimes. So if you'd like to you know, go into a little bit of a comfortable position as best as you can in this room, you can do that. Or if you'd like to um, stare at me or you know, avoid the glare, you can do that too. Whatever makes you comfortable. Um, so, just take a deep breath and just relax for a moment and listen. I knew that pain was a part of life, but thanks in part to a particular blend of God has a plan, southern roots, a suburban Midwestern nice upbringing, and a higher education in New England stoicism, I managed to skate by for quite some time without having experienced any. After a handful of traumas and the last five years, things look different now. Trauma upends everything we took for granted, including things we didn't know we took for granted. And many of these realities I wish I'd known when I first encountered them. So while the work of life and healing continues, here are 10 things I've learned about trauma along the way. Number one, trauma permanently changes us. This is the big, scary truth about trauma. There is no such thing as getting over it. The five stages of grief model marks universal stages in learning to accept loss. But the reality is, in fact, much bigger. A major life disruption leaves a new normal in its wake. There is no back to the old me. You are different now. Full stop. This is not a wholly negative thing. Healing from trauma can also mean finding new strength and joy. The goal of healing is not a papering over of changes in an effort to preserve or present things as normal. It is to acknowledge and wear your new life, warts, wisdom and all, with courage. Number two, presence is always better than distance. There's a curious illusion that in times of crisis, people need space. I don't know where this assumption originated, but in my experience, it is almost always false. Trauma is a disfiguring, lonely time, even when surrounded in love. To suffer through trauma alone is unbearable. Do not assume others are reaching out, showing up, or covering all the bases. It is a much lighter burden to say, thanks for your love, but please go away, than to say, I was hurting and no one cared for me. 
If someone says they need space, respect that. Otherwise, error on the side of presence. Healing is seasonal, not linear. It is true that healing happens with time, but in the recovery wilderness, emotional healing looks less like a line and more like a wobbly eight figure. It's perfectly common to get stuck in one stage for months, only to jump to another end entirely, only to find yourself back in the same old mud again next year. Recovery lasts a long, long time. Expect seasons. Number four, surviving trauma takes firefighters and builders. Very few people are both. This is a tough one. In times of crisis, we want our family, partner, or dearest friends to be everything for us. But surviving trauma requires at least two types of people. The crisis team, those friends who can drop everything and jump into the fray by your side, and the reconstruction crew, those who calm whose calm, steady care will help nudge you out the door into regaining your footing in the world. In my experience, it is extremely rare for any individual to be both a firefighter and a builder. This is one reason why trauma is a lonely experience. Even if you, are, even if you share suffering with others, no one else will be able to fully walk the road with you the whole way. A hard lesson of trauma is learning to forgive and love your partner, your best friend, or family, even when they fail at one of those roles. Conversely, one of the deepest joys is finding both kinds of companions beside you on the journey. Number five, grieving is social and so is healing. For as private, as, for as private a pain as trauma is, for all the healing that time and self-work will bring, we are wired for contact. Just as relationships can hurt us most deeply, it is only through relationship that we can be most fully healed. It is not easy to know what this looks like. Can I trust casual acquaintances with my hurt? If my family is the source of trauma, can they also be the source of healing? How long until this friend walks away? Does communal prayer help or trivialize? Seeking out shelter in one another requires tremendous courage, but it is a matter of life or paralysis. One way to start is to practice giving shelter to others. Number six, do not offer platitudes or comparisons. Do not, do not, do not. I'm so sorry for your lo you lost your son. We lost our dog last year. At least it's not as bad as. You'll be stronger when this is over. God works all things for good. When a loved one is suffering, we want to comfort them. We offer assurances like the ones above when we don't know what else to say. But from the inside, these often sting as clueless, careless, or just plain wrong. Trauma is terrible. We need, what we need in the aftermath is a friend who can swallow his or her own discomfort and fear, sit beside us, and just let it be terrible for a while. Again, be present. Allow those suffering to tell their own stories, number seven. Of course, someone who has suffered trauma may say, this made me stronger, or I'm lucky it's only X and not Z. This, that, that is their prerogative. There is an enormous gulf between having someone else thrust his unsolicited or misapplied silver linings onto you and discovering hope for oneself. The story may ultimately sound very much like God works in all things for good, but there will be a galaxy of disfigurement and longing and disorientation in that confession. Give the person struggling through trauma the dignity of discovering and owning for himself where and if hope endures. Number eight, love shows up in unexpected ways. This is a mystifying pattern after trauma, particularly for those in broad community. Some near strangers reach out. Some close friends fumble to express care. It's natural for us to weight expressions of love differently. A Hallmark card, while unsatisfying if received from a dear friend, can be deeply touching coming from an old acquaintance. Ultimately, every gesture of love, regardless of the sender, becomes a step along the way to healing. If there are beatitudes for trauma, I'd say the first is, blessed are those who give love to anyone in times of hurt. Regardless of how recently they've talked or awkwardly reconnected or visited cross country or ignored each other on the metro. It may not look like what you've requested or expect, but there will be days when surprise love will be the sweetest. Number nine, whatever doesn't kill you. 
1911, after a publicly humiliating year, comedian Conan O'Brien gave students at Dartmouth College the following warning. Nietzsche famously said, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. What he failed to stress is that it almost kills you. <laughs> Odd things show up after a serious loss and creep into every corner of life. Insatiable anxiety in places that used to bring you joy. Detachment or frustration towards your closest companion. A deep distrust of love or presence or vulnerability. There will be days when you feel like a quivering, cowardly shell of yourself when despair yawns as a terrible chasm when fear paralyzes any chance for pleasure. This is just a fight that has to be won over and over and over again. Number 10, doesn't kill you. Living through trauma may teach you resilience, may help you sustain you and others in times of crisis down the road. It may prompt humility. It may make for deeper seasons of joy. It may make you stronger. It also may not. In the end, the hope of life after trauma is simply that you have life after trauma. The days in their weird and various riches go on. And so will you. That was written by Catherine Widowis. Uh, and it's on the web somewhere. Want to spell it? I have copies if you guys want. Uh, W-O-O-D-I-W-I-S-S. She is the associate web editor at Sojourners. Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, the neuropsychology of trauma today. Um, and we're gonna talk about emotions and that little thing's gonna stay there for a while, I think. Oh, I gotta go this way, huh? You gonna get that out of there for me? Ah, there we go. Okay, we're not gonna look at that. Um, the first thing I wanna tell you is there's a lot of overlap and a lot of consistency in diagnoses of different diagnoses that reflect trauma um, in, in our, in our mental, mental health world. Um, so here's uh, all of the diagnoses that go under um, post-concussion post syndrome, which is uh, minor brain injury. Anxiety, depression or lability, headache, easily fatigued, disordered sleep, dizziness, irritability, changes in personality, dysfunctions of attention and memory, and apathy. Uh, ICD-9, uh, post-concussion disorder, uh, anxiety, depression or mood, lability, headache, giddiness, fatigue, insomnia, feeling of impaired cognition, exaggerated fear, intolerance to exertion, sensitivity to noise. Post-traumatic stress disorder from DSM, anxiety and fear, can't recall all aspects of the trauma, diminished interest in activities, insomnia, difficulty concentrating, irritability, detachment or estrangement, restricted range of affect, hypervigilance. Frontal lobe disorder from ICD-9, diminished self-control, foresight, creativity and spontaneity, selfishness and lack of concern for others, increased irritability, diminished attention and or memory, and major depression disorder. Diminished interest or pleasure, feelings of worthlessness, fatigue or, of lo or loss of energy, insomnia or hypersomnia, agitation, diminished concentration, and indecisiveness. So, choose your, choose your poison. Throw a dart at the wall. There's such a big overlap. Probably the biggest difference, one of the things that we found a lot about, um, we're learning a lot more about concussions and minor brain injury from what's going on in sports medicine these days. I don't have a slide for it, but I'd like to tell you this. Um, the American Academy of Neuropsychology has come out the last few years with their um, stage progression of concussion disorder, okay? Uh, a sta like we do strains and sprains, you know, other parts of the body. So a stage one, concussion is zero loss of consciousness and symptoms lasting less than 15 minutes. Um, symptoms including dizziness, but primarily talking about disorientation and concentration. Stage two concussion um, of American, Medical, American Academy of Neurology. Stage two concussion is zero loss of consciousness and, and cognitive symptoms lasting more than 15 minutes. Stage 3A concussion is loss of consciousness counted in seconds and symptoms, especially disorientation, confusion, but also headaches, stuff like that, lasting more than 15 minutes. And stage 3B is uh, loss of consciousness counted in minutes 
and symptoms lasting more than 15 minutes. And the research that this uh, organization has done says that there can be permanent cognitive and emotional damage or sequelae at uh, stage two or greater concussion. Again, stage two is zero loss of consciousness and symptoms lasting more than 15 minutes. Okay? So, um, so here's the difference that I see. I haven't found this anywhere in literature, but I have a hard time believing or at least observing that a football player that gets a concussion identifies it as a trauma. Okay? As opposed to somebody minding their own business in their, in, in their car and getting a whiplash or end injury. So, uh, you know, most of these guys, uh, football players I've worked with, baseball players I've worked with, they count it uh, as a badge of courage, not as a trauma. Um, and I gotta tell you this, I was involved I'll try to stay away from stories, um, but I'm a storyteller. Um, I'm involved in a case recently where a woman was um, uh, rear-ended on the freeway, pushed so violently that it pushed her in the car in front of her, so she got um, squished and a lot of um, whiplash damage. And uh, an MRI taken about three months after the accident um, showed uh, subcortical frontal lobe dysfunction damage, if you will, which is very, very typical in a violent whiplash injury because the frontal system is not very well protected. Um, and the inside of the skull is, is not as smooth as the outside of the skull. So in the frontal temporal area, which is right behind our foreheads, we have a lot of sharp little edgy, bony air, air edges inside the, the skull. And these things can rip and punctate you know, cause a little damage. But in addition to that, you know, our brain sits in our, in our head kind of like this, okay? This is the brain stem, this is the limbic system, and this is the frontal system right over the top of it, okay? And the only thing that anchors the brain in the skull is the spinal cord, all right? Because it floats in fluid. So if you, if you get, if you're, if you're sitting still in a car, here's a good, Here's a good trivia question for you. If you're sitting, sitting still in a car, three-point restraints, and you get rear-ended by a car going 15 miles an hour behind you, what is the first movement? What direction is the first movement your body takes? Now, most people would say forward because of the push of the car. Some people would say back. Actually, research shows that it's up. Um, because this is the issue. You're not the stationary vehicle that gets hit. The chair is bolted to the floor, but you're not bolted to the chair. And there's a little bit of wiggle room in that three-point uh, three restraint. So as the car underneath you moves forward, you for a split second sit still. And so as the car is moving under you, you have to rise up as the, as the material is moving forward. Okay, and so what catapults you forward then is uh, the, the seat pushing you forward with the, with, the, with the force of the impact, okay? Now the last thing to move here, the last thing to move is your brain. Because again, it's in fluid, okay? So it's floating in here. So the, so the first thing that happens is as your head moves forward, your brain is standing still, sitting still for a minute, so it slams, gets slammed against the back of the inside of your skull, pushing it forward. Okay, and so the, and, and again, we're right here, so whiplash, okay? So as it gets catapulted forward, then everything stops its forward movement, just like a wave on the, on the, on the ocean floor. The wave goes and then it retreats, okay? So everything stops, and the last thing again to stop, or to get slammed, is the frontal part of your brain against the forehead, the internal forehead. And then it comes to rest as the force gets absorbed and dissipated. So let me show you this. We need to, and this is true, but we've changed the terms. We need to go back to original terms in, in car management. This is not a headrest behind us. It is a head restraint. And if it's not properly positioned, you're going to put yourself in, a, in, in jeopardy of having a, a very violent whiplash injury even if you don't lose consciousness. As this brain is, is, is sliding back and forth inside your skull, it is only held together by uh, microscopic neurons, okay? 
Here's an interesting fact. If we were to take all of the neurons in anybody's brain in this room and attach them end to end, we would connect the Earth to the moon. The fact that they're not attached end to end, but networked and bundled together, is what's given, is what's given us the cognitive and emotional ability to figure out how to get to the moon. Because you certainly couldn't walk on your neurons, you know, like a bridge. Um, so these neurons are very microscopic, and, and, and they have an axon, which is where they communicate to the next neuron. They have all these dendrites. And what a lot of happens is these neurons get, especially the axons, get stretched or even torn. Okay? They're not connected. There's a little piece in between the dendrites and the neuron and the axon. It's called a synapse. And we operate on an electrical medical process, an electrical magnetic chemical process. So there's a magnetic force in there that keeps these um, dendrites and axons together. Okay? But they, so the axon can stretch. And that's going to change the communication system in the brain on a cognitive level. Um, now there's another thing that goes on that's going to change the communication in the brain on a cognitive and emotional level. And, we'll, and we're going to talk about that. Um, but you can see there's such an overlap here. So a lot of the treatment that we do um, is really, really similar to treatment it, for a brain injury. It's really similar to treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder or even major depression. Um, at, at least in the clinical uh, mode. And then we can add, the, if you will, the neuro clinical or the neuropsychological mode, which would include specific cognitive um, strategies, okay? But to tell you the truth, it's, it's basically what you guys do with cognitive behavioral intervention, somatic work, mindfulness work, things like that. So we'll get to that. Yes? So when you do your assessment, I'm hearing that you must ask about brain injuries and falls and head traumas and stuff. Absolutely. Yes. It's, it's very important to get a, a, a very thorough history. But it's also subjective, you know, because a lot of times they don't remember. For example, I was in a deposition a few months ago, and, and the lawyer says to me, so Dr. Olchese, read this little sentence in your report, you know. The sentence I read was patient reports loss of consciousness um, at the scene of accident, you know, at, at, during the accident. And he says, Dr. Olchese, um, how did you get that information? So I asked the client. He said, well, um, you weren't at the scene of the accident, were you, Dr. Chase? I said, no, I wasn't. So you, were, you weren't able to assess whether the patient got, had loss of consciousness at the scene, were you? And I said, no, no, I wasn't. So you just got this from talking to the patient, asking the patient a question. I said, yes. He goes, Dr. Chase, did you read the uh, hospital uh, emergency record report? And I said, yes, I did. He goes, you remember what it said? <laughs> Not really. He goes, well, I have it right here. Would you please read the highlighted line to us? Uh, no loss of consciousness. And he goes, well, what do you make of that? Here the emergency room doctor said the patient did not lose consciousness, and you, who didn't even have a chance to assess them, said that he lost consciousness. I said, well, you know what? I don't think the emergency room doctor was at the scene of the accident, was he? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think he I don't think he had the opportunity to uh, um, assess the patient to see if he lost consciousness, did he? He kind of looked at me and he, like, he goes, so what I'm saying is the emergency room doctor got the same, uh, got the information from the same, from asking the patient a question. He goes, well, then why was there a difference in the answers? And I said, because I didn't ask the same question. <laughs> okay. I mean, in, in, in an emergency room, we're triaging, you know, if the person's awake and alert, um, we're going to say, did you lose consciousness? And they're going to say, no. You know, because nobody knows, what, I mean, loss of conscience, what do you think? We're in a coma, you know? All right? But again, concussion is seconds to minutes. So the questions that I ask are this. Did you lose consciousness? No. What was the last thing you remember before the accident happened? Uh, I remember sitting on the freeway and, uh, or sitting at a stop sign and, you know, waiting for the light to change. And then I heard brakes screeching. And what's the next thing you remember? Somebody was tapping on my window telling me to get out of the car because it was steaming. That's at least altered loss of conscience because, and that's what I said to him. He goes, and then, so what's the, how's your assessment? My assessment is that there wasn't some, somebody standing at the driver's door when somebody rear-ended him to knock immediately after somebody hit. 
Steve Young, who most of us still remember, um, Steve Young, uh, I don't remember the year, but there was a year when, you guys might remember this name too, Irvis Gerback was the backup quarterback. Elvis, I think his name was, Elvis Gerback. Steve Young um, had a concussion, went out of the game in the middle of the second quarter, and Elvis Gerback came in. And he played the end of the second quarter, and he played about halfway through the third quarter, and then he separated his shoulder, something had a shoulder injury, and they pulled him out. Steve Young came back into the game. He played uh, the fourth quarter and half the third quarter. Um, he threw for a touchdown and ran for, maybe threw for two. There were three touchdowns. He didn't remember doing it. He did not remember playing the game. So, so, there's, so there's, you know, if you want to call it loss of consciousness, but there's also altered consciousness, okay? Um, and you know what? We know this in other ways. Um, now, this would be a chemically induced altered consciousness, but we all have heard of um, the ambient shuffle, you know, where somebody is on Ambien or Lunesta and they get up and they do wild things during the night or typical things during the night and they don't ever remember doing it. Because you see, the brain needs to be sedated and de-aroused, okay? And these medications, we're going to talk about them a little bit, these sleep medications sedate the brain, but they do not de-arouse the brain necessarily, okay? So, um, so anyway, let's move on. By the way, you are welcome to interrupt me and ask questions as long as you don't mind tangents, okay? Andrew. Returning to the deposition, <laughs> Dr. Olchesi. So this was more of an inference on your part based on the patient's answers to your questions that there was a loss of consciousness, but couldn't it just have been equally likely that there was no loss of consciousness, but instead there was dissociative amnesia due to shock trauma? Absolutely. So Psych how do you differentiate? Psychiatric term versus neuropsychological term. But one presumes an organic brain injury one assumes psychological influences that don't have to involve physical injury to the brain. And that's why a full assessment is necessary. Um, but even a neuropsychological assessment can show, can only show functional dysfunction. And as you, I showed you on that last slide, we get a lot of the similar function, um, dysfunctions in all kinds of trauma. So to tell you the truth, there's a lot of people, maybe being one of them, me, that believes that um, concussions is a, uh, if you will, a symptom of trauma, uh, along with, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, all of that stuff. It's part of the trauma process that we go through. And that's what we're going to talk about now. Yes? Well, I was just going to say, isn't dissociation also part of the reptilian brain's response to danger? At Absolutely. So it, yes. is more, it is his physiological. Yes. We just don't think of it that way. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't get, I mean, again, um, MRIs don't always help us, you know, because uh, 80, at least 80, it's really interesting, these, these percentiles, but at least 80 to 90% of um, uh, concussion disorders have negative MRIs or CT scans. Negative. No, no findings on MRIs. Because, because MRIs, um, regular MRIs do not pick up axonal stretching or shearing. Axonal sh stretching or shearing. You know, the, the microscopic changes, um, physiological changes in the brain. Functional MRIs will pick it up a lot better, but who's doing functional MRIs these days? Uh, I know they do them in Utah. I think Cal Pacific has one, um, but they don't use it very often. PET scans, but you know, a lot of this stuff is just, we're just catching up with figuring out what these things say. Uh, spec scans are pretty good, shows oxygen absorption in the brain, but none of these things show etiology of this damage, okay? So for example, um, you know, it used to be, they're getting better now, but it used to be in depositions in medical legal terms that they would say, well, Dr. Olchese, you know, your neuropsychological evaluation is pretty subjective, isn't it? I mean, we want to see objective data. You know, what's the difference here? Well, you interpret your, your tests, and you can really kind of interpret them any way you know, your presentation is. But you know, an MRI exam, that's objective. So you know what? You take an MRI exam and give it to five different radiologists, and you can easily come up with five different readings on it. Can you come back to something kind of alarming a while ago? I mean, here's a lot of 
alarming thing. <laughs> but um, one alarming thing you said a long time ago was it, that um, even after stage two, which is no loss of consciousness and cognitive symptoms over 15 minutes, that permanent damage cognitively can result. Yes. So I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what kind of cognitive yes. damage, and also because of all the findings about neuroplasticity, yes. what healing is possible. Sure, Thank we'll you. get into that. I should have brought those, those slides too. Um, uh, but can I hold that and kind of see how it develops? And if I don't get to it, ask again. Okay. Um, okay, so there's a lot of research out new that talks about an inflammatory process um, uh, to a lot of different things that happen. We, we know that we have an internal inflammatory process when there's an infection. We know that we have an internal pro, um, process when there's a sprain or a strain or any kind of a physiological trauma. And we also know that there's um, now, we know that the same internal inflammatory process happens with depression and anxiety. In fact, I was in a seminar about a year ago and the guy was from UCSF and he was presenting that the old theory of depression, which was the monoamine oxidase theory, you know, the stuff in the SNAPs, um, is incomplete. And that's why a lot of antidepressants are incomplete in treatment, at least part of it. Um, and what he talked about was this inflammatory process which is taking over in uh, psychiatry research as the parallel component with what we used to understand of the synaptic transmission for depression, serotonin, dopamine, all that stuff. So this is the inflammatory process for post-traumatic stress disorder, post-concussion disorder, and sprains and strains. So here's what I do when I'm working with a patient that's had a concussion. Uh, particularly. Um, I talk about the analogy that, that uh, a concussion is a sprain to the brain, okay? Because a lot of people don't understand concussion or minor brain injury. And by the way, um, we've been asked in, in neuropsychology, National Academy of Neuropsychology and um, International Neuropsychology Society uh, have asked us not to use the word concussion anymore. That we use the word minor brain injury. Be um, because concussion has such a uh, bell rung, you know, simple thing, get up and get back in there, fall off a horse, you know, fall off a bicycle, get back on it. And so we want to emphasize the fact that this is an injury that needs to be treated um, uh, sociomedically, if you want to call it that. Okay? So, um, so it, we all know, or I'll explain to you, uh, just for clarity, so we all do know, uh, yes. A quick question, what's the difference between contusion and concussion? Uh, contusion is, a, is an internal bruise, and a concussion is the overall umbrella. Okay, so a con an internal bruise in the cerebral cortex of the brain, to the brain itself. It is basically a popped blood vessel inside the brain, caused by the um, whiplash injury or the impact of the injury. Um, okay, so, um, so we all know how a sprain works, or I'm going to share with you at least the neuroendocrine manner of a sprain. We get this, we'll just call it an ankle, okay? We get this sprained ankle and immediately our neurological system, our nervous system, sends a message up to the brain and basically it just says, pain, you know, something's wrong here, you ow. And then the brain does, wants to be the, the doctor. I mean, we want to be our own physicians. So the brain immediately sends fluid to protect the ankle. That's inflammation. Okay? Now the brain is a, is a pretty amazing little guy because it, um, it is both general and specific. So this inflammation follows the nervous system back to where the sprain was, but it's not like that, if you ever saw it, it's not like that old commercial of Doan's pills, you know, where they show a silhouette and the guy takes aspirin or a Doan's pill or something, and it just goes to the back and nowhere else. I mean, the entire system inflames, but the, but the impact of the, of the, of, or the, the, uh, a majority of the swelling of the inflammation goes back the same uh, nervous system message back to where the message came from. In a way, if you want to call it, this is how we can have phantom limb syndrome, okay? A nerve that, a nerve that is supposed to go all the way down to the foot is irritated because it's been cut and it's swelling because it's been damaged. Okay, and that goes up to the brain and the brain interprets that that's the nerve that came from the foot. And so the brain is going to interpret pain in the foot when there's no foot to have pain in. But there is certainly 
a telephone line that used to be connected to the foot that is continuing to communicate to the brain. All right? Um, and so, um, so let's go on. So here's what happens. And this is, some of you may know this, this is called the APA, HPA axis. That's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal cortex axis. There's another one called the HPT axis, which is the hypothalamus to pituitary thyroid. Okay, and they work together. But here's what happens when we have any kind of uh, injury, infection, concussion, post-traumatic stress, depression, anxiety. Okay, there's a perceived threat whether that threat is this ankle sprain or, you know, the, uh, the lion chasing the um, doe in the meadow or whatever, there's a perceived threat out there. And please, you know, this is what irritates me sometimes in medical legal um, terminology. They want to identify, they want to take, they want to make objective statements about the level of the impact. Okay? But I just want to share this with you. What you perceive as a threat, I might not. And what I perceive as a threat, you might not. And that's based on genes, heredity, you know, acculturation, maturation, all of it. Exposure, um, who our parents were, who our grandparents, all that stuff. Good old union work. Okay, so the perceived threat triggers the amygdala. If I had my little brain model here, the amygdala is right behind, right, like right about there, right where the nose bridge is, but almost in the middle of the brain right behind the frontal system. And on my, main, my brain model, right where the amygdala is, it has two words, anxiety, fear, okay? Because you see, these are, this is all about the reptilian brain. The, these these uh, labels that we use is the beginning of survival when we're under a threat. You have to become uh, diligent, vigilant in where the threat is coming from so that you know how to respond. And Anxiety gets you vigilant, okay? And a little bit of fear gets you ready, okay? So those are the emotional terms. This is the chemical process. So the amygdala then triggers the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is our internal thermostat, okay? It manages, it's managing all, not managing, monitoring all of these chemical levels, even temperature, if you will, all right? And, uh, and it's communicating. So by the way, um, some of you may be past this or looking forward to it. I doubt that. But, um, uh, you know, there's this process in, in women's development that's called menopause. There's a process in men's development that's called wimopause, but um, we don't really talk about that much. But menopause, when women are going through that because their hormones no longer need to produce, they have sometimes hot flashes. Well, guys, that's the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is trying to communicate to the pituitary and the adrenal cortex to get these darn hormones pushed because the hypothalamus just identified that, hey, we're low in estrogen or progesterone or whatever. So manufacture some. And the pituitary gland goes, don't have to. We ain't got any hair to do. And the hypothalamus gets a little irritated and says, no, we need it now. And hot flash happens. Okay? So, it's a one theory. So anyway, the hypothalamus um, releases this little amino acid, CRF, and it hits the pituitary gland. Pituitary is one of the areas that, that does secrete and distribute all of these hormones. A lot of neurotransmission goes on there. And it releases this little guy called the ATCH, another little amino acid. I'm still waiting for this, but I'll tell you about that in a minute. And it um, triggers the adrenal cortex. Now, we know what the adrenal cortex does because we know the word adrenaline, right? Energy. You guys know this? Maybe a lot of you do. But, um, you know, we don't use um, adrenaline uh, in the United States as much as we use two other terms. Epinephrine and norepinephrine. Same thing. Europe, they call it adrenaline, noradrenaline. For some reason, we have to be different. So we call it epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine is pure, unadulterated, crude oil energy. Norepinephrine is taking the crude out of it, refining it, so that we can use it. And they both come from dopamine. They're the hormones that come from the neurotransmitter, dopamine. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Anyway, the adrenal cortex then releases this little guy called cortisol. And I want to tell you this. I didn't before, but I want to tell you this. Anything that a doctor wants to put into our body, any chemical that a doctor wants to put in our body, our body wants to manufacture it on our own. 
Okay? We have our own steroids. We have our own cocaine. We have our own Prozac. Okay? Um, now, the question is this. Two, twofold, the question is this. Do you know what to do to regulate all of these chemicals and keep them in balance? And the second question is, even if you do, can you do it? Because of forces within and without. So cortisol is our steroid. Okay? And now you're going to understand why athletes love steroids. Because cortisol triggers the hippocampus. Many of you guys know hippocampus is the seat of working memory. It's also what we think is the switch plate between working memory, and I'll just define that for a minute. Working memory is being able to remember what you're doing while you're doing it, if you want to put it that way. It's organizational skills, it's you know, tracking skills, it's sequential, it's all of that. Working memory, um, and the hippocampus is where working memory happens, and it's also where working memory uh, it gets, gets identified to store or not. It's not where it is stored, but it identifies it, switch plate, to send it to storage if it's important enough to hold on to. So do you think, can I just ask you, do you think that in the terms of survival, that if you faced a bear in the woods uh, and escaped, that your hippocampus would choose or your brain would choose that, that the way you escaped or didn't would be a good thing to remember for future? Probably, huh? It's, it, even if you didn't, because then you could correct it. Well, if you didn't, who cares? But if you got away, but you could do it better, okay? But here's what happens when there's too much cortisol going. So what cortisol does, when there's too much cortisol going, or for too long, it cuts off the hippocampus's ability to secrete serotonin into the system. Serotonin, as you probably know, is our three C's. Serotonin is our calm, cool, and collected chem chem chemistry. It allow, it's, one person puts it this way, and I like this. Um, dopamine and acetylcholine are on the left side. Not really for any reason, but I put them there. Um, dopamine is our gasoline, and acetylcholine is our accelerator. So you can manage how much dopamine you're using by acetylcholine in your system. Serotonin and GABA over on this side, on the right side, and you'll f maybe figure out why I put them there, even though they're not really there. Serotonin and GABA, or that big long word that nobody can pronounce, so we just call it GABA. Serotonin is our cruise control. Okay, you can save a lot of energy. You know this. We can save a lot of gasoline if we know we're going to drive 65 miles an hour in the freeway, freeway for a while to just set that puppy on cruise control and just let the car relax. Just let it hum. And you save gas mileage. So serotonin saves energy ex ex expression or waste, even when we're active. GABA is our brake, okay? So when we're going too fast and we have to make a turn, or we have to get off of cruise control, we have to hit the brake to slow down. And GABA and serotonin are very involved in post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety and concussion and how we operate on a daily minute-to-minute -minute basis. So when we're stuck in this system, we don't have serotonin calming the system so that we can make decisions calm, cool, and collectedly. And that's why athletes like steroids, because it keeps them from calming down from the threat. It keeps them hypervigilant on the threat. It also dries out your ligaments. So it makes your muscles more fragile because the ligaments attaching the muscle to the bone don't work anymore. So the muscles then have to get stronger to support themselves inside your body, like in your spine. And that's how they puff up. Yeah. Norepinephrine is adrenaline. Right, like the precursor to... It's the same. Okay. Yeah, it's my understanding that the amygdala goes straight to the um, locus coeruleus. Yes. And then that, that, that surge that you feel, yes. like right before you're in an accident, yes. that's norepinephrine, Absolutely. not adrenaline. That's right. The well, adrenaline takes a second to... I don't gonna, know. I was a little confused about We're going to talk about that. About it's, that. It's, it, it, uh, yeah, don't get confused. It, okay. You, you got a good picture of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was just 
because once guess, it, all of it is instantaneous. We're in my mind, that. like there's a direct line between the amygdala and the locus coeruleus. Yeah. And that it takes just a second longer for everything else to get involved, or a millisecond longer, yeah. I guess, which really is yeah. negligible. Yeah. Yeah. 